to very good. We are recording. Uh, welcome everybody to our um, second part in this two-part series on successful alternative dispute resolution for your company. And um, we've got, uh, I think, a great panel and a great um, uh, outline for our presentation for you today. Hopefully, we will be covering any uh, concerns and questions you have. Of course, you are always welcome to post any questions for us in the chat. And we will open it up um, at the toward the end of the presentation for any questions that you may have if you want to jump on your microphone and um, any comments that you have. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Part one was mediation. Part two, today we will be discussing arbitration. Um, so our panelists today, um, we are uh, very fortunate to have with us Mike Ryder. He is Senior Vice President, Deputy General Counsel for ResMed Corp. Um, ResMed is a medical device provider worldwide. And <clears throat> Mr. Ryder um, has also previously worked for Callaway Golf. And in his career, uh, he has participated in dozens of mediations, arbitrations, trials, and litigation-related matters. So um, he'll be sharing with us from his experience today. We also have Ed Walton, my partner from Procopio, who is the chair of our litigation team and leads the litigation department. Uh, also a super experienced trial attorney. Uh, he has extensive experience in not only trials, but also mediation and arbitration uh, at a variety of different courts and in a variety of different contexts, um, all types of commercial disputes, insurance related disputes, um, as well as uh, some personal injury, product liability, admiralty, and maritime law. Um, myself, uh, I am also a member of the litigation department at the Procopio firm. I am also the firm's general counsel, and uh, I have a practice involving arbitration as an arbitrator, as well as mediation as a mediator. So we're very happy to be with you today. And we're going to go ahead and get started with our first topic, which is what is the role of a um, general counsel uh, with regard to arbitration? And a couple of different um, roles are uh, going to be the subject of our discussion. One is setting the dispute resolution strategy for your company in terms of um, where you're going to use arbitration and provider selection and that sort of thing. The um, second topic is facilitating the participation of the organization in the arbitration and serving potentially as the face of the entity at the arbitration. So let's start with um, Mike, as to um, your thoughts on these topics, role of general counsel. Thanks, Carol, and thank you so much for inviting me to be on the panel today. It's you know really an honor to be uh, in this kind of setting with two such experienced lawyers. So I really, really appreciate it. And I do think that in-house counsel has a very unique role in terms of the selection of arbitration. Um, particularly the ability to determine in what situations you want to use arbitration versus litigation. And for me in my practice, I really look at arbitration as um, accomplishing three roles where I really try and pay attention to including an arbitration clause in a contract or an agreement. First, if I wanna mitigate particular kinds of risks, Second, if I want to 
arbitrate with particular kinds of parties. And third, where I want to mitigate the availability of particular kinds of remedies. So let me explain what I mean by that. In terms of particular risks, one of the biggest risks that innovative companies face, companies like ResMed and Callaway Golf and a lot of the companies that I'm seeing on the screen today, is the um, submission of, of new ideas to the company and the entertainment of mutual non-disclosure agreements where you're looking to explore new relationships on behalf of the company. And all those opportunities are really exciting for the company and the business people always want to do it, right? They always want to enter into NDAs so that they can get a look at what the other party has to, has to offer. One of the things that I view as a big risk to a company that's an innovator is the risk of infecting your products with somebody else's idea, whether on purpose, whether the other side's trying to infect you or just by accident because you're working on something that the other party happens to be working on. That's why you're talking to them. And so one of the places where I use arbitration agreements is in mutual non-disclosure agreements, particularly when you've got an industry participant on the other side of that. And what I mean by that specifically is to use an arbitration clause to limit the remedy that may be available if everything goes sideways on you. Because really the risk you're trying to mitigate there is the risk of injunction. So you can draft your arbitration clause to direct the arbitrator that the only remedy that she can enter is a remedy of royalty. Now you can really try and get fancy and put the parameters of the royalty in the agreement. You can try and talk about how you're gonna measure it. That to me is just too fancy and it gets you bogged down. I think just having the ability to go to arbitration if you get into those kinds of disputes and have the only remedy be a royalty so that you're not out of the market is a really good use of an arbitration clause. That's the kind of area where I think an in-house counsel really has a unique role as compared to an outside lawyer because your in-house clients look to you for that kind of experience and that kind of judgment. Carol, you're on mute. Thank you, thank you. I just don't wanna make noise to interfere with it while somebody else is speaking, but thank you for that. So um, obviously the in-house counsel is going to have to think through arbitration strategy for the company. Um, Mike, that's an excellent example on the NDA. Um, In-house counsel would also want to think about what other contracts are out there and um, what other contracts the company is entering into, and also employment relationships where you may want to, um, you may or may not want to include uh, arbitration clause. Um, and uh, so all of these different contexts may raise different concerns and different issues. Um, and you need to take a methodical approach toward all of that as you're looking at um, what the company, what is in the company's best interest. Uh, Ed, did you want to um, share your thoughts on role of in-house counsel? Uh, well, it's a disclaimer from the outset. I'm uh, I'm a trial lawyer. I've never been in-house counsel, uh, so I certainly defer to Mike uh, and uh, with, with his excellent summary of kind of how he looks at it uh, uh, from the point of view of in-house counsel and and obviously serving the role. I mean, role of in-house counsel is. Uh, is a kind of a dual role. One is the protection of your client legal advice and all that, but there is a certain business interest um, issue to be served. And of course you wanna do that as much as you can um, within the limits of your uh, providing legal advice. And, and it sounds like Mike has come up with a pretty good uh, way to do that and serve both interests at the same time. Um, I, uh, 
I would say that, um, you know, I, I guess the only thing I'd add is that it seems like this strategy would work even if you don't have the opportunity to rely upon a pre-negotiated um, uh, agreements. If you get it, let's say you get into a, a spat with a competitor, but you, there's no NDA, there's something else going on that's caused that to happen. Seems like you could still have the opportunity to sit down with that competitor or at least ask um, the competitor to sit down and talk to you about the possibility of, hey, look, let's approach this in, in a way that, yeah, we're kind of at war or we're mad at each other or, you know, somebody's got their nose out of joint on one side or the other, but perhaps we can sit down in a business setting and agree to a process for this dispute resolution post um, the dispute arising and, and then try to implement exactly what Mike has talked about. Uh, so I, it, I don't think it's just necessarily limited to an NDA, but I, it's also something you uh, would want to at least consider at the inception uh, of any dispute that you might get into, even in the absence of a, a, a prior contract. I think that's a great point, Ed. And oftentimes when I'm settling disputes with a competitor, I, I try and, do, and have that discussion up front. So mm -hmm. as part of a settlement agreement, I typically like to have a three-step process. So the first step is a meeting of people at a sufficient seniority within the company that they can resolve it. If there's a potential to resolve a dispute, let's put it in the hands of the people who are best able to resolve it. Second step is mediation. And I understand you all talked about mediation last time, so I won't get into all the reasons why I love mediation, but I love mediation. And then the, the third step is where the first two steps have not ended up in a resolution of the matter is to have an arbitration, particularly when you're talking about a dispute with a competitor, because that basically takes down the blood pressure of the parties that can be you know, increased so dramatically when they're looking in the whites of the eyes of a jury that you know, business people are terrified of. At least with an arbitrator, you've got the benefit of, of defining what kind of arbitrator you want, how much experience, what area it's in, you know, what kind of background they need to have. And because arbitration does end up more often than not ending up with some, you know, not a, a winner take all kind of a resolution, but a, a resolution where uh, each party, you know, gets their ox gored a little bit. Um, business people like that a lot better than the, them rolling the dice in front of a jury. So I think competitor disputes are really a good candidate for arbitration. And I like to have that decided up front. So I don't have to ask. I can just say that's what we've agreed to. So that's the light, the way I like to approach it. Excellent, excellent thoughts. So um, let's go ahead and turn to uh, one of the next topics, which is the pros and cons of arbitration. And uh, we could hotly debate this for hours, I think, but we're gonna try to give you kind of at a high level, some of, the, um, some of that debate. And uh, we're gonna start with the many benefits of arbitration. Uh, and I think what you'll see, however, is that some of the benefits are also detriments or downsides. And so, um, but probably the primary benefit of arbitration is avoiding the jury. Um, we all uh, have the opportunity to look at jury verdicts and in particular areas, um, employment is a good example. Uh, there is a risk of jury verdicts that are, um, at least from the business's perspective, uh, potentially not warranted, uh, out of alignment with the um, with the true merits of the case that can result from uh, plaintiff's counsel or the plaintiff themselves just um, it really uh, creating a kind of uh, passionate plea to the jury. And so um, to control for that uh, in not only employment but many other contexts, 
um, arbitration is um, the go-to alternative. Um, another benefit is privacy because we are through arbitration keeping um, things out of the public record. Now, sometimes you, you will still find that a plaintiff will file a lawsuit and then you have to go ahead and move to compel arbitration and that lawsuit is somehow um, going to just live forever in the public record. Um, but in general, the um, litigation of the dispute is not going to be available to the public uh, blow by blow, if you will, um, in the court's file, and that can be a big advantage. Um, another aspect that is, I think, becoming more and more important is the um, ability to get a speedy resolution. And as any of us who are doing litigation are really well aware right now, the courts got backed up during the um, pandemic period. And so now we're stacked up waiting for trial dates into 2022, 23, et cetera, and beyond. Um, that's not true in every court in every case, but it is, um, it's, a, it's a reality of what is going on, at least in some venues out there. So getting a case resolved through arbitration can um, cut through that. Uh, and let me just turn to Ed. Um, and what do you think are some of the benefits of arbitration that you've seen in the matters that you have handled? Well, certainly the ones that um, you just um, uh, enumerated. And uh, there, uh, and uh, let me just preface this by saying we're going to get into the detriments in, in next. Uh, and um, uh, but it, they're really sort of mirror images uh, in a lot of cases. And it's really kind of a question of what is your particular situation, either pre-dispute when you're, you're drafting your resolution um, of disputes clauses uh, in your contract, or even after the dispute has arisen and, and you have some opportunity to control that, um, you really need to look at um, all of these benefits and detriments and try to fit them into your particular situation because it's not, it, what may be a benefit in one situation be, could easily be a detriment in another. But so back to the benefits part, um, the, uh, there are also limitations on discovery generally, um, which is part of the expense issue. But um, if, you, if you have a matter that you know, you're just concerned that it's going to be taken up with useless discovery. Now, I, when I say useless, I mean discovery that although it might be helpful or interesting to know, it's not going to be definitive in the resolution of the matter, then uh, limitations on discovery can be a very good thing. It forces lawyers to be quite efficient and thoughtful about what they really need and don't need um, and can really uh, streamline uh, the process. And another benefit that I don't think um, uh, Carol mentioned is uh, the, the question of appeal. Now, this is classic, one of these things that <laughs> could be a benefit or detriment, but uh, by and large, a, uh, uh, an arbitration decision is final and binding, and um, it, there are some ways to try to attack it, and we'll get into those, but in, in general, they're, they're enforceable. And uh, if you got crosswise with the arbitrator uh, during the arbitration or something went wrong and you end up with a, you know, a result which you don't like, you're, you're, you're done. And, and even, even procedural issues um, are not going to be appealable uh, because the arbitrator really has a free hand and is not necessarily bound by the rules of evidence um, or by conventional application of common law or statutory law. Uh, so uh, it, that that is a, but it can be a benefit. I mean, it, it, obviously, because you don't, uh, you, you're now not going to have to incur the time and expense of a lengthy appeal process, which could, which oftentimes figures into what people, how people view the potential for settlement, because uh, they'll they're willing to resolve the case on a basis much differently than they than uh, uh, than they otherwise would if there was a lengthy appeal process during the case. Uh, let's turn to Mike. Uh, Mike, give us your thoughts on benefits of arbitration. So I, I think the benefits, you've got a really good list, but one that's not really on here explicitly 
is the availability of a resolution. I mean, look, COVID is here to stay in some way or another, right? We're locked down, not locked down, mass, not mass, trials, no trials. I think that's going to be the new normal for a while. And the thing that has been a constant during COVID is that bench trials and arbitrations can go forward virtually. And it's, all, it's a heck of a lot harder to do a jury trial virtually than it is to do a bench trial virtually or to do an arbitration virtually. And so it seems to me, you know, built in that speed of resolution bullet point is the fact that it may be the only way to resolution if we're in a lockdown situation or a court hasn't reopened for jury trials and the parties can't agree to a bench trial. If you've agreed in advance that you're gonna have an arbitration the arbitrator is willing to make that money to make that arbitration go forward, then it seems to me you've got an opportunity to get your dispute resolved. Mm -hmm. On the discovery front, you know, what makes an in-house lawyer absolutely crazy is runaway discovery that is not useful. And so not only do I do arbitration clauses, I spell out the discovery that's available in the arbitration. One document request, one set of interrogatories, one deposition that'll last no more than eight hours. Boom, boom, boom. And when you, you know, tell a trial lawyer, whether they're in an arbitration or not, that they've got to be that efficient, trust me, they will be efficient if they know that that's all they've got. And, uh, and then you relieve yourself of the craziness and the crazy expense that comes with runaway discovery, which often occurs in a trial because, you know, judges are in the business of giving the parties full disclosure. So I think those are the two huge benefits of arbitration. Very good. Um, so now let's flip it and um, turn to some of the downsides of arbitration. And, um, you know, one of the one of the big issues um, that I think we've kind of alluded to already is the expense. Uh, when you file a case in court, you are able to, uh, you know, you're getting it for free almost. Um, and what you realize if you engage in arbitration is that the arbitrator is a professional judge or lawyer, whoever it may be, is going to bill you by the hour, essentially, and their provider takes a cut as well. And so um, the expense can be very significant. Uh, and um, that is driven by many different factors, the number of motions that get filed, the length of the hearing, the number of witnesses, the number of parties, etc., um, and so that is probably the biggest downside. Um, of course, Mike's strategies for limiting discovery, I think, will also end up limiting the um, expense because if you only have one depot, you're only going to have to fight over one depot and have to go to the arbitrator about it. Um, but uh, to me, another big downside is the very limited right of appeal, which Ed has already mentioned, um, because depending on whether you're um, under federal or state law or what your arbitration clause says, the right to review of the arbitrator's decision is very limited. Uh, and so you're kind of going to be stuck with it uh, unless you can meet one of the very limited bases for, um, for reviewing that decision. Uh, and depending on the complexity of your matter, depending on the novelty of the matter, um, what is the existing law in your matter and how clear is it, uh, you may be fine with not having an appeal uh, or it may be a nightmare. So that is something that, of course, you do really want to think through and think about. Um, and uh, Ed, I know you have some strong uh, thoughts about downsides of arbitration. 
So um, why don't you weigh in on this? Well, I, I don't know. I think Mike's bringing me around. You know, uh, he's very convincing. So uh, maybe I'm, I have to rethink my thoughts about arbitration. But but seriously, I I um, I, I, I arbitrate all the time, and um, and I've had very good experiences with arbitrators generally. And so I think it's a it's a good way of, of resolving it. You don't always get the opportunity to put in the sorts of safeguards that. Um, uh, Mike is talking about. I mean, a lot of times I get an arbitration clause in, a, in an agreement that says the parties agree to arbitrate, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, so we have to figure out what to do. And um, you, you're not always in a position to be able to negotiate that to the to uh, a procedural format that is, you know, that you really are happy about. Um, but but let me just play devil's advocate a little bit about this because I think it's important to look at our our system. And uh, you know, our system is. Uh, the judicial system that we all learned about in law school, it, you know, includes this this right to go to court and have a forum that is is virtually expense free and the availability of very professional, well schooled, smart people to help you resolve your dispute and the right to have a jury trial and have um, you know somewhere between six to twelve uh, men and women, good and true, listen to your presentation and make a decision. And for a long time, this has served us pretty well um, as a, a method of dispute resolution. There, there's clearly been abuses of, of that, uh, but there's also, in my view, a lot to be said about the jury system and, and its availability and how it is an effective way of, of resolving um, disputes. And uh, so I'm a fan of jury trials. I mean, uh, it, it, a lot of that's selfish, and I think that's true both uh, trial lawyers that if you've tried uh, jury trials, you, I mean, they're, they're interesting, they're fun, they're stressful, there are a lot of things, but um, they are practicing law in, in, and give you a lot of satisfaction as a professional um, in, in terms of presenting a case and getting a decision and feeling good about having advocated your client's position. Um, and it, and they, add, they also have the added benefit, um, and this is where this appeal thing comes in, of making sure that any glitches that occur during the process of the, the dispute resolution are, are addressable. And it keeps everybody on their toes and you have to be really careful with regard to a presentation of evidence and the judge has to be careful not to allow the wrong things in or, or to keep the, the things that should be presented to the jury out. Um, and to, to generally keep everybody pretty honest about the presentation of, of, of the dispute and getting and try to get it resolved within, you know, a system that's been developed over centuries uh, in, in terms of trying to uh, resolve disputes. So um, I think uh, everything has its place, you know, not uh, there, there are there are jury trials that really don't make a whole lot of sense to me. I, but, but what comes to mind immediately is uh, uh, intellectual property, especially patents, uh, somehow they've managed to make it work, but um, uh, it just seems there are some things that are, are not ideally suited to uh, jury trial resolution, but there are some things that, um, that are. And I think in this process between arbitration and jury trials, you really have to think about all of the benefits that we've talked about versus what are uh, are some of the uh, the detriments of, of arbitration and then weigh them against what you think you might be able to achieve by a, a jury trial. I guess I'm saying that uh, it, jury trials are, are, you know, the demise of uh, jury trials are, are have been greatly exaggerated in the press or whatever, right? I think we still, well, there's still a place for them and I think they're in, important, um, uh, you know, kind of if, for no other reason than to force people to, uh, you know, enter into reasonable arbitration uh, provisions if they do have uh, fears about going uh, before a jury. So I get, in summary, I think those are my, uh, my thoughts about it. Mike, did you want to weigh in on this as well? Well, you know, I think that this, that's why you hire a really smart lawyer like Ed. So the single <laughs> biggest mistake that an in-house lawyer can make when deciding that you're going to uh, have an arbitration clause in your agreement is to simply say the parties agree to arbitrate, where the parties agree to use the AAA rules, where the parties agree to use the JAMS rules. I think that your input as an in-house lawyer with the advice of an outside litigator that's been through the trenches allows you to to create an arbitration clause that's informed, 
and deliberate. Because if it's informed and deliberate, you can solve every single one of these downsides because it's agreed to by the parties. So when the other side starts whining about how they don't get 77 depositions, you can say, well, you agreed to one, so pick your one. Or when the other side wants to serve 77 document requests, you can say, no, we limited ourselves to 25. And sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Mm -hmm. So to me, the benefit of arbitration is that you're agreeing up front with the ground rules are gonna be, and you are you can take away all of these downsides in the right commercial disputes. By the way, Ed, I love patent cases in front of juries, but you know, sometimes you want that patent case in front of an arbitrator. Yeah. It all depends. It needs mm -hmm. to be informed and deliberate. Yep. Thanks so much, Carol. So we've kind of segued, and thank you for that, um, into our next topic, which is arbitration clauses. Um, in your contracts for your company. Um, and Mike uh, has made the important point that you really need to think this through. Um, Ed's example of we have agreed to arbitrate um, well, it doesn't really get you very far. Uh, a couple of different things to be aware of here. First of all, you need to be thinking about which of the potentially applicable statutory schemes are going to be applicable. And if you have a choice, which one do you want? Um, which one do you prefer? Uh, you may be operating in California. You may be operating under the Code of Civil Procedure. You may be operating under the Federal Arbitration Act. You may be operating under an international um, statutory scheme that governs international arbitration. The important thing is, which scheme are you under? Uh, and um, which one do you want if you have a choice, which you very well may. Uh, and then on top of that, um, the selection of your provider, uh, do you want a particular set of rules? Because of course, they all vary a little bit. Uh, but then layered on top of that, as Mike has been um, advising us all, uh, you can, by agreement, make your own rules, essentially. And um, it, including uh, the venue, the um, discovery, the scope of discovery, the uh, how many arbitrators you're going to have, what type of arbitrator you're going to use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, payment of expenses is something else you can provide for in your agreement to some um, varying degree. Uh, you can select a retired judge as your, um, as your arbitrator or a legal uh, practitioner, a lawyer, or a lay person. If you're engaged in a particular type of dispute, you can have a single arbitrator or a panel. Um, all of these things are um, for the general counsel with input of outside counsel to give some, uh, some thought to in view of what is likely to happen uh, and, and to materialize as a dispute that would be <clears throat> that would be governed by arbitration with your company. Um, so Ed, I'm guessing you've probably seen some arbitration clauses beyond just we agree to arbitrate. Uh, what are your thoughts on um, thinking through some of the options on arbitration clauses in contracts? Well, well you know, Mike's alluded to this a little bit uh, earlier uh, it, that uh, you really, you, it, this is an important decision to make uh, it, it, at, at whatever stage you make it, you just you have to take into account everything that you know about the situation that uh, the, or the, the agreement that you just entered into or, uh, and its potential for an, a dispute arising. And you really have to kind of forecast what could go wrong here. Um, and in that forecast uh, of what could, what's most likely to go wrong, um, 
you, you will that you will get the sort of the genesis of what are the things that you need to cover in your arbitration agreement. But certainly the basics, you know, would include such things as uh, where the, the uh, arbitration is going to take place, by whose rules, uh, whether, you know, how big of a, a panel are you going to have? Are you going to have just one arbitrator or three? And of course, expense is important there. Uh, although having three uh, panelists, uh, typically the, uh, there are provisions that uh, talk about, you know, uh, each side picking one arbitrator and then the two arbitrators pick a third uh, it, to try and keep down the expense and, and battle about that issue. Uh, there's other ways, but I mean, there's a whole bunch of, of methods of trying to accommodate the goal of getting um, all of the safeguards into your arbitration that you desire, but, but thinking about how to do that efficiently um, and in the context of the likely dispute. And uh, so it, it's, it's a real thought process. I mean, it, it's something you, you can and should at the outset in, in providing uh, for arbitration an agreement, you should go through that process. I think more times than not, the lawyers who are involved in um, uh, drafting the arbitration provisions uh, may not go through that uh, exercise and because it's time consuming and uh, you got deadlines and whatever, but it is a pretty important thing to do uh, if you can carve out the time and the resources to do it. And it may save you a whole lot of trouble later on. And if you're in a if you're in a business that um, often ends up in disputes of a typical kind, <laughs> you know, like you, you, you these things repeat themselves. Um, it, 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 taking the time to draft uh, a form arbitration clause that is easily modified to to suit the particular situation you find yourself in with any given contract or given contractual relationship. Um, it, I think it's prudent. It's prudent to do that. It's time well spent, uh, and uh, you know uh, you can, can you can add in choice of law provisions to the extent that the arbitrator is willing to uh, be guided by a choice of law and a number of other um, uh, pr provisions that um, would be important to the resolution of your dispute. So, uh, Mike, would you like to give us, I know you've shared some thoughts already on arbitration clauses, any other tips that you would like to add? I think um, one other tip is picking, you know, which law it's going to govern. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had a discussion uh, to prepare for today about the, you know, the Federal Arbitration Act versus the California statute on arbitration. I'm, I almost always go with the Federal Arbitration Act because it preempts uh, state law that's contrary. There's a very strong public policy in favor of arbitration that's been articulated by the federal courts over and over and over again. And at the risk of demonstrating that I don't read the Daily Journal every single day, um, it's my sense that in California, you know, the decisions tend to take away from arbitration. You, you find decisions that say this kind of dispute is not suitable for arbitration or that kind of dispute, this employment dispute or that's, that class action dispute. And I don't want courts that are saying, let's look for the reasons not to arbitrate. I want my court to be saying, let's find the reasons to enforce that arbitration clause as the public policy applicable in this court. So I think that's one of the most important decisions you can make is what law is going to govern your arbitration clause. That's um, critical in my point of view. Yeah, that's a very good point uh, and the law has gone back and forth um, over time with, um, with the state courts kind of chipping away at arbitration and then the federal courts saying, no, there's preemption uh, under the FAA. Um, arbitration is very highly favored, et cetera. So um, I think that's a really important insight. So, Carol, if I, if I might, it, uh, uh, that's a really interesting point that Mike makes because what he's basically he's focusing on the issue of I if I agree to uh, to enter into uh, 
a contract that contains an arbitration clause, I expect um, the mutually uh, agreeable uh, you know, clause in, in that contract to be enforced. That is that the, my right to arbitration, which I've freely and fully bargained for, um, is going to be enforced by the courts. And, and it, you know, likely the federal courts are going to give him that enforcement uh, more than uh, perhaps state courts in several jurisdictions. The interesting thing about it is, I think that it, that in state courts, especially in, in California, you even though the, the the courts might intervene and try to take away your right to uh, arbitration, they're probably less likely to intervene if there's been if, during the course of the arbitration there's been some procedural or constitutional you know uh, deprivation of rights of due process or something like that than the federal court might. So um, you, you have you have an enforcement of arbitration. But at the same time, I think, um, and again, at the risk of not being totally up to speed on all these cases, uh, I, I think there's a there, there's a little bit of a leaning in the federal system to allow for, hey, look, if it's not done right, uh, you know, we might uh, we might intervene here and uh, talk about uh, the way in which your uh, what you agreed for agreed to uh, mutually is not being honored. And it, you know, it's, it, you you got your arbitration, but it's not being honored in the in the spirit in which it was intended to be honored by the arbitrator. And I think it, it's it's kind of helpful, uh, probably, just to let uh, everybody know. I mean, there's the Federal Arbitration Act, um, and then there's a, a under the California Code of Civil Procedure, you've got sections 1280 um, and following a governing contractual arbitration in California which I think can be modified by the parties. Um, and then uh, there's a California International Arbitration and Conciliation Act, um, and there's uh, uh, statutes interpreting that. So, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a whole lot of different um, statutory models out there um, that uh, you, if you are considering using a statutory model and incorporating that within your arbitration clause, as opposed to what most most people do, which is just rely on the Jams rules or Judicate West or whoever or AAA, whoever they're using, um, it, you it, you would do well by researching a bit those uh, various statutes and the pluses and minuses uh, of incorporating them. Agreed. Uh, so let's let's um, in the interest of time, let's um, shift gears a little bit here and talk about arbitrators. We've um, touched on it before. Uh, you've got the option of, um, you've got two options. Private judging is one option. Um, these are under yet two additional different statutory schemes. Um, temporary judges can be appointed by the court. Referees can receive a reference from the court. Uh, this um, came to everybody's attention recently uh, because uh, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt were using a private judge. Um, and so very uh, recent case on disqualification of the judge due to um, some issues with the disclosures that were made. But these are two other options. And uh, they each have their own statutory um, uh, provisions that govern uh, the appointment and the, um, the scope of the power of a judge versus a referee, et cetera. Uh, and then um, let's... Uh-oh. I think we may have lost Carol. Did Carol freeze? Ed, can oh, you hear me? I can. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think Carol is um, uh, has uh, frozen out. I mean, we can continue on. Oh, here we go. She's back. She's back. Yeah. So, um, sorry about that. Uh, I wanted to get both of our panelists' thoughts on the selection of private arbitrators, including. Uh, whether you prefer a retired judge, uh, lawyers, or non-lawyers who may have subject matter expertise. Um, Mike, let's start with you. So, I, look, I typically have uh, favored the jams 
panel of judges. They're, they tend to be retired judges. Um, they tend to be uh, very esteemed in their, you know, in their uh, jurisdiction. Um, you can generally find a, a retired judge with the kind of background that you're looking for, for the kind of dispute that you have, um, particularly with competitors. I've spent a lot more time litigating in the International Trade Commission over the last few years. And it seems to me a retired ITC judge is exactly the kind of judge you want for a patent dispute in some cases, because they're used to dealing with issues of infringement and validity. And so I have always, you know, gravitated towards jams because I've had very good luck with jams, which is not to say that AAA doesn't have great judges and private arbitrators. Um, and so if the other side feels strongly about it in the course of negotiating an agreement, then, you know, I'll roll the dice and agree with the other side because that then demonstrates that I'm willing to work it out with them in terms of drafting our agreement. But give, give me a choice and I'll choose jams. Ed, would you like to share your thoughts on this particular topic? Sure. So um, uh, the choice to me seems to be between uh, retired judges, uh, lawyers, and um, experts. Uh, and the facts of the case are, are going to drive that uh, choice a lot. Um, the advantage of a judge is that judges generally, by the time they're um, in, uh, they're, uh, you know, uh, dispensing their skills as arbitrators, have seen a lot, um, either federal or state judges. They've seen all kinds of cases. They've seen all kinds of situations. They're a pretty good read of, of people uh, uh, for purposes of judging credibility and those sorts of issues. Um, and, uh, and they have judicial temperament, uh, which is, you know, what you're kind of looking for if you uh, are, you, you know, trying to replace the, the uh, what the courtroom might otherwise look like. Um, Jams does tend to be, uh, have a lot of judges. Um, Judicate West has many. Um, AAA is really, you just don't know what you're going to get. You may get a, a list to select from that has no judges on it. Um, now, there are plenty of uh, capable arbitrators out there who have not been judges, um, and there are certainly in, in certain uh, areas, uh, uh, for, I, I have a maritime background, so it, it, in, in maritime cases, uh, having somebody who's not a judge but really knows uh, maritime uh, commerce and uh, maritime law uh, can adjudicate a salvage situation, for it, uh, instance, and, or a cargo situation in, in a way that would, uh, it would make the head spin of, a, of a, another uh, arbitrator because they just, it's not an area they know anything about. Uh, so it's really fact dependent, I think, and, um, or situation dependent. Um, but you can, <clears throat> I, I would tend to gravitate towards a judge, um, in, in, in my view, uh, you know, all of the things being equal, unless there's a special a special need. Carol, can I just offer one last point of view? And, and this is a little bit of a back to the future moment because I know you all talked about mediation already. But in mediation in particular, I feel like you really need to pay attention to whether you're getting a judge or yeah. a mediator that is trained as a mediator. So many judges mediate cases by saying you're going to lose. And that's the refrain that they use to try and get the parties to settle. Whereas a, a trained mediator who has not been a judge, but learned how to be a mediator at mediator school and has a track record of successfully mediating with all of the bags of tricks that they bring to the table is one where you really need to do your homework when you're picking a mediator. Sorry for the detour into the oh, past. That's okay. Uh, I think those are really good points. Uh, so let's go ahead and um, I just want to touch upon, because I don't want to run out of time, arbitrator disclosure. Uh, this is becoming more and more of an issue. Um, I think that what is happening is that disclosures are getting very heavily scrutinized um, on the back end if there is a decision that is adverse uh, and um, 
because a, a failure to disclose something that should have been disclosed is a basis for um, potentially setting aside an adverse decision. And so um, it's important to look at disclosures on the front end. Uh, in my experience, the disclosures are getting longer and longer uh, and more detailed and um, more, more information is being put out there. There has been recent litigation about um, disclosures by jams as to ownership in the jams organization. Um, I think that really did not end up going anywhere, but it was um, it was a good example of um, trying to look for something that arguably should have been disclosed and. Uh, we could debate whether or not that would even be material, but really as a basis for um, setting aside a decision. And so um, interested in either of you, Mike or Ed, did you want to share any thoughts on arbitration disclosure issues? Well, the only thing I might say, and I, I defer to, to Mike on this, but it might be one of the things you, you would uh, uh, consider as a part of your uh, arbitration clause that you're, you're drafting to um, require to make a, a, a to have a requirement that the arbitrator uh, make disclosures uh, of any uh, conf uh, potential conflicts of interest in um, uh, once uh, you know potent uh, conditionally uh, appointed um, because the question becomes under you know <laughs> under what authority does an arbitrator have an obligation to disclose anything and how do you enforce that so. If you have a contractual provision, you, it's enforceable. I think from my perspective, you know, this has not been something that I've focused on because I haven't been burned by it before, knock on wood, and I'm knocking deliberately. Um, and, you know, it to me, you rely so much on your outside counsel to help you identify the arbitrator that's going to serve your purpose well. That's one where I, you know, tend to rely on the expert that's helping me uh, prepare my case to know enough about that arbitrator to be able to uh, help me decide those issues. And candidly, almost any really good arbitrator mm -hmm. is going to know the parties, is going to know the lawyers, is going to have ha been on one side or another of a case. So you're going to, your lawyer should be able to give you the kind of background that you need to be able to pick that arbitrator, mm -hmm. whatever the disclosure level. Very good point. Um, so let's turn to arbitration procedures. And you touched upon some of this already. Uh, your procedures are going to be um, dictated by your clause, the statute, what you've baked into the agreement, um, as Mike has talked about. The selection of the arbitrator can also be something that is um, governed either by statute or by agreement of the parties or by the rules of the provider if you have selected those. Uh, there are um, probably one of the biggest issues with arbitration is uh, that the rules of evidence uh, either don't apply at all or are applied very loosely, applied in a very flexible way, if at all. Um, one of the bases for setting aside a result is the arbitrator's refusal to hear evidence. So given that, um, it, the arbitrator may tend to uh, just allow evidence to come in and uh, tell the uh, parties and their counsel that they'll consider the weight of it, They'll consider, um, you know, what is the significance of it and just let it in. Uh, I think there are other um, issues that come up in arbitration regarding uh, third-party discovery that um, revolve around the fact that arbitrators will not have the right to issue a subpoena except in connection with the arbitration hearing itself. Um, under Mike's discovery regime, I don't think this will be an issue. Uh, 
because he's going with the one depot and document discovery, et cetera. But I think this can have an impact on, um, on the um, arbitration itself and being prepared for the hearing. Uh, and um, the last factor is that typically there's no record made of an arbitration hearing, but you do have the right to ask for a reporter and uh, you do have the right to pay for that. Um, and so that's another option. And I'm interested in, um, Ed, your take on some of these issues, and then we will turn to Mike. Okay, well, I think you've covered them pretty well. I mean, the, the record of the hearing is useful simply for uh, purposes of a daily, but it's just as it is in a trial, daily preparation of what you're going to do the, you know, the next day. It also may end up being important if you do run into the rare um, appellate issue, but it is expensive to have a court reporter sit through the, the whole proceeding, so that you have to weigh that. Um, it, 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 we didn't talk about, I don't think, uh, dispositive motions. I find that kind of a weird one. Um, I, I, I mean, if you're in an arbitration, the whole idea is to have an arbitrator hear things expeditiously and get it, you know, kind of get everything on the table and let the arbitrator um, figure it out. And a dispositive motion sounds very legal to me, whereas... Uh, um, but the arbitrator does not necessarily need to even adhere to what we would typically think of, for example, as a motion for summary judgment and all of the um, attendant uh, safeguards, especially in the state of California, that, that there are for getting summary disposition without a full hearing. Um, it seems like a, 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 an interference with the process of, of just, you know, getting to it, letting the arbitrator hear everything and make a decision. Um, and the third party discovery part I, I, is uh, that crucial distinction between not being able to subpoena for discovery, but only having the power to subpoena for the hearing is something that needs to be taken into account as you do that process of determining whether or not this is um, something that um, uh, you, it should is subject or suitable to arbitration, uh, whatever you anticipate the dispute might be. And your answer may be, well, there's going to be so darn much third-party discovery that arbitration is really not appropriate. It's a possibility. Mike, what are your thoughts? I mean, look, I, I think, again, um, there's pros and cons both ways. You know, a lot of judges will let all the evidence in and say the jury will sort it out. So the fact that the arbitrator is going to hear all the evidence and then sort it out is not something that really bothers me. I think, you know, I can't uh, even think of a case where an arbitrator has done a dispositive motion because that's against her pecuniary interest, you know, to throw out the case early as opposed to deciding it. Whereas there are judges who will give you summary judgment, right? Uh, more so in federal court than state court, but they'll actually you know, rule on a motion for summary judgment. So I think when you opt for arbitration, you're opting for the whole banana, right? The process of all the evidence is gonna come in, you're gonna have a hearing, you're gonna get a written decision, it's gonna cost you X amount of money depending on what you've done to circumscribe the rules, and you've done that to mitigate the risk that you're trying to mitigate because that's important to you as an in-house lawyer and important to your company. So I think all those arbitration procedures have pros and cons mm -hmm. and you choose arbitration for the pros, recognizing the cons come along for the ride. Exactly. Uh, Let's, let's just touch on, um, you know, what has become a huge experiment during the pandemic, uh, trying to do everything online. And uh, it has its pros and cons as well. Um, I have um, my own thoughts about online arbitration. Uh, as we discussed with mediation, it can be more convenient for the parties. Um, we were going to do a arbitration that involved matters that were governed by um, New York law uh, in New York 
And none of us had to fly to New York. Um, not that we could have during certain times during the pandemic, that just wasn't an option. But we were able to at least plan to go forward with the arbitration. The, um, the whole matter resolved in a mediation. But um, so the reduction in expense, the convenience, um, and, uh, you know, it, the learning curve that we all went through with learning how to use uh, Zoom or one of the many other platforms that we've all had to learn over the past year and a half um, in order to present evidence, uh, share our screens, share documents. Um, you know, we've been through that and we um, conquered it for the most part, I think. Uh, but there may be some online um, limitations when you're looking at um, complex multi-party um, matters with thousands of exhibits, uh, you know, that may be pushing the limits of what um, is convenient to do in an arbitration. Uh, I am interested in our panelists' thoughts, and um, then we're going to open it up for questions and comments from the participants. But let's start with Ed on this. Well, I, I mean, as, as Mike said, I, uh, I, it's here to stay. I mean, it may have been kicked off by uh, the pandemic, but um, online, uh, you know, appearances uh, and dispute resolution are here to stay. I don't know that a jury trial can be effectively um, conducted online, but certainly I think mediations and arbitrations can, although there is there is something lost. No matter, there's just something about being in the room with everybody and, uh, and uh, getting, picking up on everybody's, um, uh, you know, everything about everybody. Uh, but, uh, but they're here to stay. And, and uh, I think the, 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 the wise thing to do is make the best of it and start to figure out how to embrace um, online uh, communication. It's, it's a lot less expensive and it's more convenient. Um, uh, the, the downsides can be addressed by having rules uh, and, um, and enforcing those rules about participation. Uh, and, you know, I, I think uh, it, it, it's just, it's change and I, we, all better, we all better get on board because it's happening. I mean, look, in my own view, virtual's here to stay. I mean, we've surveyed our employees, you know, 80 or 90% of them have said they want a hybrid working approach going forward, that they want to work X amount remotely and X amount in the office, some remotely completely very, very few in the office completely. Um, mostly my generation want to come back to the office every day as soon as I can. Anyway, sorry. Um, I think one of the other issues that you touched about here though that kind of goes hands in hand, hand in hand with virtual is one of the benefits of an arbitration clause is you pick where the arbitration is going to go forward. And that's often a part of uh, a point that people are very emotional about and it can create a point of leverage for you during the negotiation so if you know if you know that you're going to get a good arbitrator in Dallas as a paired as compared to Kansas City or Delaware or New York you can give in on that venue provision and because you know you're going to find a good arbitrator no matter where you go and if it's all virtual anyway who cares mm -hmm. where the people are sitting so it it's a negotiation point you've given away, um, but that really may not matter in the long run if it's virtual. Mm -hmm. Well, so we are a few minutes over our scheduled um, time for the presentation, but we do have uh, scheduled time for questions. So um, I will just open it up for any questions or comments. If you would like to turn on your microphone, that is perfectly fine or if you'd like to post something in the chat, we're happy to try to address it for you. And um, it, any, any thoughts you may want to share with the group, uh, that is also welcome. So I'll give you a minute or two to, um, to go ahead and uh, do that and uh, let, you know, let you all know if I see anything in the chat that is, um, for us to, uh, to answer. Uh, 
did you, did either of you, Mike or Ed, want to give any concluding thoughts? Um, I would say this, I mean, to this audience, that the, um, you know, uh, use your outside counsel, uh, I think, for uh, in, in the way in which Mike was alluding to, which is if you, if you are desirous of having an arbitration, um, it, it, I think you do well to ask your outside counsel who you depend upon to, you know, to handle your disputes, um, to weigh in on any particular situation, help you plan for that arbitration. Um, it, it, it's like uh, going to your litigation counsel to say, how should I draft this indemnity provision or this attorney's fees provision or whatever, because you are concerned that there may be a dispute and you want to know what the experience is of litigation counsel with respect to the interpretation of, of various contractual provisions. It's the same thing with arbitration, I think. Um, and important to get the input of, uh, of a good litigator, uh, you know, with respect to fashioning that clause and trying to anticipate under the circumstances, what is the best, you know, what, what's the best way to phrase this and what are the best terms to put in given what we anticipate might be um, uh, an issue. So uh, I, I guess that'd be my concluding thought about all this. Mike? Two concluding thoughts. One, when you've got a really good litigator that you trust, I think you need to ask them about your arbitration clause to make it really state of the art for you. And, and most really good lit litigators like Ed are gonna be very anxious to advise you about that, probably at no charge because they're a trusted partner of your company. There's so, Mike giving away my time. Yeah. Well, Thank you, you know, Mike. I thought I'd help you out, Ed. Um, second thing I think is um, important with respect to arbitration to remember is arbitration is viewed suspiciously in some parts of the world, in some parts of the country for some kinds of disputes. I think arbitration was viewed by a lot of employers with their employees as a way to take away rights. And while that was clearly not what employers were trying to do, that's the way it was viewed in the press or by employees. And so if you're gonna use arbitration, make sure you know why and that you are taking into account how that election will be viewed by your employees, by your customers, by the world at large. When you're saying to the world, I wanna arbitrate, it's easier to say that with a, a competitor or a partner or a customer than it is employees or others that may view it as a potential way for your right, their rights to be truncated. Thank you both, um, very good thoughts. My concluding thought, um, just to wrap it up, is that obviously there are a lot of nuances and subtleties to um, this entire topic. It um, bears uh, a lot of thought. And um, so uh, as you're working through it, we hope that our presentation has been helpful to you in thinking through some of the issues. Um, and we're happy to help you if you do um, want further advice on this going forward. So um, thank you to the panelists. And thank you all for attending. And it's great to uh, be able to be with you today. And with that, we will wrap it up. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, everybody, for attending.